welcome to the hills. All of you that are in person in Keller, West Fort Worth, our North Richardson Hills campuses, and of course, all of you that are watching online literally from around the world right now. I'm so thankful that you made it a priority to spend some time with us this holiday season celebrating Jesus. I also hope that you get to spend a lot of time these next few days with the people that you love the most. Now, it reminds me of a story of an old man who got on the phone and called his son who lived in a distant state and said, you just need to know that your mother and I have decided to get a divorce. 45 years of misery is enough. I don't even want to look at her face anymore, and I don't want to talk about it. So call your sister and tell her. And he hung up the phone. The son is stunned. He calls a sister in another state and said, Dad just called and said he and Mom are getting a divorce. She says, ain't no way. So she calls her dad and said, I don't know what you're thinking, but you're not getting a divorce. We've already bought plane tickets. We're going to be there tomorrow. You don't do a thing till we get there. You don't sign a paper. You don't talk to a lawyer. Do you understand me? He hangs up the phone. He smiles, turns to his wife and says, well, the kids are going to be home for Christmas and they're paying their own way. You see, when you're young, the best thing about Christmas is what you get. I remember as a boy with my brother, we'd rush into grandma's house, go straight to the tree and count how many gifts had our names on them. Because when you're young, the best thing about Christmas is what you get. But when you get older, the best thing about Christmas is not what you get. It's who you get to be with. My grandmother actually had a spiritual gift. It was the gift of giving guilt. <laughs> she started in March. Are you going to be at my house for Christmas? Which as you get older and you marry and you have other family obligations became more and more difficult. But here's what I know about grandmothers. They don't care about all your technology. They don't want to do Zoom. Don't try to tell a grandmother on Christmas Day that FaceTime is the same thing as being there. Because grandmothers do not want to do love long distance. And neither does God. And that's why Christmas is such good news. So listen again to what the angels told the shepherds as they announced this good news. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared in the, with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Obviously, this is a big deal. An angel concert breaks out. And what is this good news? Well, it's simply this. God has come. Then what Christmas does that is unique from all the other religions of the world is announces that God is not fixed, He's not stationary, He's not immobile, He's not hard to reach. Now, there is no other religion in the world that says about God what Christmas says about God. That He's for us, He has come to us because He wants to spend eternity with us. So let me just share some quick good news about this God who comes. It's good news first because God comes where we are, not where we wish we were. That Christmas declares God comes to find us instead of waiting for us to try to get somewhere where we could find Him. John put it like this, the Word became human and made His home among us. And I like how the message paraphrase puts that verse. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And by the way, he didn't move into a ritzy, exclusive, gated neighborhood. That's not how God 
came. Let me illustrate this way. You all recognize this picture. This is a presidential motorcade. Do you have any idea what it takes to move a president? C-17 planes have to fly. A lead car. They have to fly uh, cars that move people out of the way. Uh, they have to fly the actual limousine itself, which is a tank on wheels designed to withstand a nuclear, chemical, or biological attack with the president's blood type on board and a decoy limo and other cars full of heavily armed agents and a communications car and an ambulance with helicopters flying overhead. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars a year to move a president. And yet he changes every four to eight years. If that's how a president moves, how would you think God would move with light shows in the sky and earthquakes and angels on every street corner? No, God came to an obscure village to a little unknown couple of such pitiful means they had to put the baby in a manger. Don't make that idyllic like they do on the Christmas cards. It was a feeding trough. No mother posts a picture of her baby in a feeding trough. You see, God comes where we are. And Christmas reveals he will show up in places where he is the least expected to show up. To find the people that might think they were least deserving to be found. God's been known to show up in refugee camps and prison cells and rehab centers and cancer wards. He's even been known to make an appearance or two at church because God wants to reveal himself to you right where you are, not where you wish you were. And that's because God comes for everybody, not just for the somebodies. See, it's significant that the angel showed up in a field. That's not what I would have done. The temple is where the hot shots hung out. That's where the rich people are. That's where the powerful people are. That's where the religious elite are. That's where all the newspapers are. He shows up to shepherds. Again, don't make that idyllic. Now, in nativity scenes, they have on absolutely clean robes holding fluffy little sheep. That's not who these guys were. In those days, you couldn't get a much lower reputation than to be a shepherd. You were considered unemployable. You were considered to be of such poor reputation, you couldn't give testimony in court. Do you know where shepherds lived? In a van down by the river. <laughs> uh, they were considered too uneducated, too dishonest, too insignificant. But what the Gospels make clear is that no one is too two for Jesus. And so in the birth accounts of Jesus, you find young people and old people. You find men and you find women. You find rich people and poor people. You find insiders and outsiders. Even if you don't read your Bible much, you've probably heard this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. My favorite word in all the Bibles in that verse, whoever. We're all citizens of Whoville. That verse says everybody is a somebody to Jesus. And Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. God doesn't love who you he wishes you were. God loves whoever. God loves you right now. Where you are, who you are. Let me illustrate it this way. 1939, Montgomery Wards wanted to get more kids to come to their in-store Santa. So they hired a guy named Robert May, an ad exec, to write a poem that they would give away. And it became very popular. In fact, they gave away several million copies. And so 10 years later, they decided to make it a song. They hired Johnny Marks, Robert's brother-in-law. He put a little tune to it. They took it to Dinah Shore, to Bing Crosby. They turned it down. They got the singing cowboy, Gene Autry, to sing the song. 
and it became the best-selling Christmas song in history. And it's about this guy. Why did that song connect to so many people? It's a catchy little tune. It's a plucky little dear. But here's what I think is the genius of it. It's a song about grace. Rudolph had a defect. He wasn't good enough. He was an outsider. But someone loved him the way he was and invited him in and said, come join me on a great mission. That's how God came. He became one of us to save all of us. That's why Jesus said later, whoever lives by believing me will never die. That's a pretty bold statement. How on earth could that be true? And that gets us to the very last big good piece of news. God comes to remove our sins, not to remind us of them. Now, you may not use the word sin very much. In fact, it may have been a long time since you've even been in a church building. But you agree with me about this. You ain't got it all together and neither do I. Nobody listening to me right now says, you know what? I do life as well as it could be done. Everyone needs to be like me. No, we all have our issues. We don't need people to point out we got problems, but they do. Bruce Larson's an author who tells a story years ago. He's in California, took in his children on a bike ride. They're out in the country. They see a sign, naturalist camp. He thinks, awesome, I'll show my kids some nature. <laughs> they go down a dirt road. Didn't take long to figure out what naturalist means as six naturalists ride up next to his family, totally naked. Before he could say a thing, his five-year-old said, Dad, um, they're not wearing their helmets. Isn't that like us, that we can find something wrong about anybody? You doubt me? Just get on social media. It's a national pastime. And that's how some of you think about God. He's making a list and checking it twice. And he knows there's a lot of naughty and not enough nice on your list. So I want you to listen to me. God didn't come to post your wrongs. He came to pay for them. The angel said to Joseph, your wife will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. If your greatest need was more money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need was more pleasure, he could have sent a performer. He could have sent a doctor if health was our biggest need. But our biggest need was rescue from our sins. The angel says, I bring you good news. A Savior has been born to you. Jesus came to sinners. Jesus came for sinners. But he didn't become a sinner. What Jesus became was a sin offering. You see, if I was going to define sin in one sentence, I'd say it's when I put myself where only God deserves to be. And salvation in one sentence is God being willing to put himself where only I deserve to be. And so Jesus came, fully God, fully man, tempted in every way, just like you and I are. But he never once got outside the will of God. He lived a sinless life, which qualified him to be a perfect substitute and to take the penalty that sinners deserve. A sinless life who died a sinful death. In other words, he took our hell so that he could take us to heaven. He came a long way, but if he had not gone to the cross, he wouldn't have come far enough. But God thought every single whoever was worth it. And the Bible says God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Because God didn't do love long distance. 
And he still doesn't. Because the best thing about Christmas is who you get to be with. So let me remind you, his name is not God was with us. We sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. The good news is not just that God came. The good news is that God still comes. He still shows up in the most unexpected places to find people who don't know how to find him. And so I have a very dear friend who's also a pastor who told a great story. So they're having a service at their church and a fellow from out of town shows up. They meet. I'm glad you're here. Why are you here? Well, I just can't get enough of God these days. And he gave his testimony. It was about three years ago, today, Christmas Eve. That man had made some mistakes, some things he couldn't fix and couldn't take back. His wife had left him. He decided it was time to end his life. His plan was to drink a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey. He had already written the note. The gun was already loaded. There's a knock on the door. It's a neighbor that he barely knows. He said, would you like to come with me tonight to my church for Christmas Eve service? (laughs) He said, no, I've got plans. And he's trying to shut the door. And this man, his neighbor, who by nature is a timid fellow, says, I'm sorry, this is not like me. But I've just got this strong, strong sense. God wants me to bring you to church tonight. And he went. And God came, and another lost child was found. My guess is, for a lot of us, this has been a good year. But for all of us, it's also been a hard year. It's been dark at times. But the Bible says, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish it. And the good news is, no matter what we're going through, God has come. And he shows up in the most unexpected places. Because he wants to be with us. So we're going to light these candles in just a moment after I say a prayer. And it's going to be our way of saying... That God is here right now because he wants to spend Christmas with us. Would you pray with me, please? So, God, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for loving everybody and changing everything. Thank you. For not loving us long distance. My prayer, God, it's a bold prayer, but I'm going to pray it because you're a big God. Is that in the next several minutes. That people that haven't felt your nearness in a long time. Will. Please come, God. Please be with us now. Thank you for refusing to love long distance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.